everybody and welcome back to yet another lecture. This week we are going to be talking about revolution. Uh, we have been talking about enlightenment philosophy and uh, the political movement known as the enlightenment. And I've been promising you for weeks that that was going to lead to direct political change and now it has arrived. Yay! Um, so this era in the 1700s and early 1800s is going to be characterized by revolution across Europe into the Americas, all over the world, really. Uh, but we're going to be focusing on two, the American Revolution and the French Revolution. They're going to be inspired by a lot of the same ideology, and yet they're going to play out very differently for reasons we're going to get into in lecture. So here we go. The American Revolution, as we were talking about last time, we had gotten as far as the shot heard around the world, the outbreak of uh, hostilities at Lexington and Concord. Um, but as we talked about a bit last time, the buildup to the American Revolution or the revolution of the American uh, colonies against uh, their British mother state, metropole, I guess if you want to call it the official Greek term, um, that had really happened uh, relatively in a short period of time. Uh, following the Seven Years' War, there was a bit of uncertainty as to what exactly the position of the colonies would be relative to their parent state, the British government. Um, and there was a great deal of anxiety, uh, to make a long story short, uh, because colonial legislators, people who had been making laws and ruling and governing themselves, really had for uh, decades been left to their own devices and allowed to make their own laws, to make their own taxes, to make their own rules and run their own show. Uh, in the Americas, they didn't pay any taxes directly into the British government and they didn't deal with a lot of oversight, frankly. Uh, Britain had had a whole lot of its own problems to deal with since the colonies had been founded, civil wars, etc. And so they really hadn't take, played very active a role in establishing governance of the colonies. Now, in 1776, the anxiety of these colonial elites, people who were wealthy, most of them quite uh, large landowners, those who were not large landowners were usually still big property owners, like Sam Adams was a brewer in Boston, for instance, we had printers, we had all kinds of people who were influential and wealthy. They were concerned that they would lose their influence. They were concerned that they would uh, find themselves second fiddle to some kind of imperial elite that would be imposed from Britain itself. This was a large part of what is motivating them to organize a rebellious movement, to organize a revolution. And they're also really in a great position because they're well equipped. Having recently fought in the Seven Years' War, colonial militias were well trained. They had uh, up-to-date weapons at hand in many cases. They felt confident that they understood the tactics of uh, modern warfare. They were ready to fight. And so this seemed like an opportunity to make sure that they wouldn't lose the uh, sort of freedoms to do as they had been for all this time. Now this is a little bit odd. As revolutions go, it's almost an oxymoron, the American Revolution. It's a revolution so the people who were currently in charge got to stay in charge. Usually that's not how revolutions go. Usually revolutions are about replacing government, one government with another. In this case, it was, in a sense, an effort to maintain the status quo. And that's really important to understand because it is going to characterize how the revolution plays out. Okay, so... In 1776, the Second Continental Congress is summoned, uh, and in this meeting of, again, mostly elites, mostly legislators, people who are very influential uh, in colonial government, what they decide to do is to declare independence, there's the Declaration of Independence right there, we've read it for class, uh, is to declare independence from Britain, stating all of their uh, grievances neatly. It's mostly uh, written by Thomas Jefferson. He, it's a little bit of a collaborative effort, but it is mostly his. Um, and then they also appoint George Washington to be the commander of the Continental Army. The Continental Army is going to be cobbled together out of colonial militias. Uh, and Washington, who had had quite a good deal of success in the Seven Years' War, is put in charge of it. So they begin organizing to resist British rule. They have a whole bunch of uh, problems early on. They have to gather enough supplies. They have to gather enough money to uh, finance those supplies. They have to figure out exactly how they're going to organize the army and pull it together as fast as possible. They need help and support. 
and they're going to get it. This was uh, perhaps the first. Well, I, I, you, well, it's arguable, but uh, this is one of the first kind of open military tests of the philosophy that people had been talking about for nearly a hundred years in uh, Europe, but that had really been catching on in a huge wave in the last, oh, say, 40 years or so. People were talking about the ideas of the Enlightenment, which we talked about uh, last time, specifically the notion of natural laws that govern the universe and how it works, and the idea that you could use reason and logic to try to move your society into accord with those natural laws. If you could respect people's natural rights, for instance, life, liberty, and property, um, as uh, John Locke would put it, then that government would be in harmony with nature and therefore it could perfect some of the uh, inherent injustices and problems that had plagued mankind since the dawn of forever. That was the idea. It is, the Enlightenment is profoundly an optimistic um, philosophy and there were a great many people who wanted to test it and wanted to see it play out and this seemed like an excellent opportunity to see if that could happen you had people who were credible people like Washington and Adams uh, all of the Adamses there was a whole clan of them um, John Jay uh, Benjamin Franklin Thomas Jefferson these were people who uh, moved in elite circles and they were considered respectable by leaders, political leaders in Europe as well. And so the thought was, this is perhaps a movement we can get behind. These are people we can trust. And so there's going to be a, a wave of supporters, people who are also interested in these ideas, particularly the challenge to monarchy um, that was represented by this uprising of uh, British colonies against their uh, monarch and their overlord from Britain. Uh, testing the idea of uh, government only being valid with the consent of the governed, for instance, no taxation about representation, all of those catchwords, all those catchphrases were very moving and resonated very heavily in Europe as well as in the Americas. Um, some of the main leaders, people who left Europe to come and help support Often they were just volunteers. Sometimes they came with big truckloads of money and connections, like the Marquis de Lafayette. Uh, his name was Guibert de Mortier, and he was a, a marquis, which means he was a nobleman from France. He was very moved by the idea of Enlightenment philosophy, and he was an eccentric character. If you have a chance to read a, a biography of Lafayette ever, you should. Um, he was just larger than life, and he was very moved by this idea of freedom, of liberty, of creating this new enlightened kind of government, and so he is going to defy the orders. He's a nobleman, and uh, he was forbidden directly uh, by the King of France from leaving France and going to the Americas to help uh, participate in this a conflict because it was because he was so noble it was perceived uh, that he would represent the government of France on some level or not even though he's acting unofficially so they forbid him to leave he pretends he's going to obey he sneaks off in a boat it's very dramatic and he <laughs> turns up um, in what will later be the United States presents himself to George Washington offers his help and advice and expertise and they become enormously good friends. Uh, Lafayette is going to be a key advisor for George Washington. He's going to be kind of his right-hand man throughout the entire um, colonial conflict. He's also going to use his influence in France to court French support for the uh, war effort. He's going to be such an influential and important figure uh, in the American Revolution that uh, monuments are built to him afterwards all over the place. If you go to Washington, D.C., right across from the White House, it's Lafayette Square. Square. There's a statue of him right there. And uh, afterwards, of course, um, towns and villages, states all competed to have their towns named after him. Uh, just locally, we have both Lafayette and Fayetteville because they were in such a fight over who would be named after Lafayette. He was a massive hero as a result, but there are others as well. Uh, General Pulaski from Poland is going to come and help organize troops um, and train them and drill them. For instance, in modern uh, warfare, you also have General von Steuben, uh, a German, who's going to do the same thing. If you kind of look around the place names of upstate New York, you'll find the remnants of these revolutionary figures all over the place because everything's named after them. Uh, but uh, regardless of all of that, what happens is that there's a lot of interested, optimistic people who are very 
engaged with this idea of this enlightened revolution and they come streaming to uh, help and support the colonists. It nevertheless is going to be a relatively small scale conflict. We're not talking about uh, something like the Thirty Years War where we're going to have millions of people involved. It's relatively small. Um, there's not a huge number of troops on either side. The advantage the British have right off is that they have a much more powerful and competent navy. And one of the first things they do is they blockade American ports to try to stop uh, supplies from getting in. And that's a major hurdle and problem for the Americans. And this looks uh, initially like it's going to decide the war, really. The British are sending regular troops in. They're blockading the harbors. There's a great deal of trouble getting enough in terms of supplies for the American colonial armies. There's a great deal of struggle early on in the war. What ultimately is going to uh, flip that and make a difference really is the participation of other countries. France in 1778 is going to kind of hop off the fence and see this uh, American Revolution as a potential way to get back at Britain. France was still mad at Britain. If you remember last week's lecture, there were a, a bunch of reasons for that. But the Seven Years' War is one of them. That was where France and Austria and Russia had Prussia pinned against the ropes. It looked like they were going to win. And meanwhile, Britain had been grabbing up land in North America, winning uh, territorial concessions because they weren't really worried about fighting on the continent in the Seven Years' War. Then when the Seven Years' War ends, France is left kind of high and dry by its allies, and they they end up having to concede territory to Britain and that really ticks them off. They're also still mad about that. Uh, the Britain and France were still mad at each other about that whole uh, Scottish uprising. Um, the um, the Jacobite uprising where they were backing uh, James's descendants. It's a, you know, you remember that whole long story. But basically there have been tension between them for years. And now that the Americans are rebelling against British rule, it seems to France like this is a great opportunity to stick it to Britain. And so they're going to do that by rounding up a whole lot of money, a whole lot of money, and giving it to the colonial armies to help uh, sort of feed and supply them. They're also going to send French ships, and this is the most important part. They're going to send the French Navy to help break the British naval blockade and allow all of those supplies to get into American harbors. This is fundamentally going to alter the course of the war. The American revolutionaries are going to win largely through the intervention of the French as well as others. Okay, so I'm going to skip over a lot of the uh, details of the battles and the entire course of the war. If you ever have a chance to take an American history class, as you probably have at this point, you will cover this in loving detail. So I'm not going to get into it too much for the interest of time. We're just going to skim over it. There are several battles. They end up starting uh, to go the American colonists' way. The American colonists have a few advantages uh, that you've probably covered if you take an American history class on this. Um, they have a tendency not to fight in the, the whole standard European style of everybody going to an empty field and standing in a line and shooting at each other, uh, partly because of the terrain. They take advantage of the terrain, they take advantage of their local knowledge, they take advantage of all kinds of things. Um, and as a result, the American colonists are going to get the upper hand. They're going to win some battles and they're going to take advantage of the fact that this war, the American Revolution, is deeply unpopular in Britain. This is the same moment when the Wilkes affair is afoot, where people are arguing for expanded franchise, the right to vote in Britain. There's a lot of talk about opening up Parliament's uh, representation to represent more people in a more fair way. And so when the American colonists rise up and say, we've been running our own show this whole time, you have no right to try to bring us under a tyrannical monarchy at this point, there's a lot of uh, people in Britain itself who find that resonates with them, who also would like to see less uh, absolute control of the nobility and of the monarchy and to have something that looks more like a true republic, something that looks like more of a, uh, a sort of democratic way of governing. And so also, even if it were not uh, a political issue, 
in Britain, the American colonists were very much considered part of the British Empire. They were considered uh, sort of Britain abroad, if you will. And so a full scale all out war where people are being slaughtered left and right uh, against these American colonists really doesn't go over well. It, it's very deeply unpopular and unsavory. There's just no appetite uh, to perceive American colonists as enemies uh, in Britain itself. And so for that reason, Britain's having resistance at home. There's no real appetite for a full-scale, all-out, full war. On the other hand, they've also got France, who's meddling with their navy, and then it gets worse for them. Spain sees this as an opportunity in 1779. They're still nursing a grudge against Britain for a variety of reasons. They see this as a chance to get back at them as well, and they declare war on Britain for their interference in trade policy and so forth and all that kind of jazz. They're going to start sending their ships. They're going to start sending their influence and messing with Britain. Then uh, Britain ultimately declares war on the Netherlands because the Netherlands had been sneaking along this whole time, sending uh, supplies and using their ships to break British blockades to help out the American colonists. And so Britain ends up in this conflict where they've got Spain and France and the Netherlands and the uh, American colonists and their own people uh, in Britain itself who are all kind of rallying against this war. And so in 1783, they just kind of quit. They're like, you know what? Fine, fine, whatever. And so they agree to sign the Treaty of, Spa of Paris and recognize American independence. And that will uh, ultimately resolve this revolutionary war. Now, this painting that I've included here on the right, uh, I've included it. It looks odd, probably, like it's damaged or something. That's not what happened. The painting really encapsulates British attitudes toward the Revolutionary War and its conclusion. This is their official diplomatic attitude. It was, and you've probably seen a few of these paintings uh, in various lectures, pretty common when wars were concluded to commission a painting that showed like a treaty being signed to commemorate the end of hostilities. Well, that happened at the Treaty of Paris as well. Uh, in 1783. And you can see here the painting was begun and significantly worked on. You've got George Washington sitting at the desk thanks to Ben Franklin, John Jay is the guy standing on the left there. The Adams is. They're all sort of standing there to uh, sign the Treaty of Paris. They've got the treaty and sprawled across the desk there. And then you have this like empty space over on the right. That's where the British delegation is supposed to appear. But they refuse to sit for the portrait. And they were so grudging about it uh, that they wouldn't sit for the painting, and so the painting was never finished. And I've included it here for you to look at just because it encapsulates the whole British attitude toward this war. They uh, concede, they give the Americas their independence, they grant it, they recognize it, but they're really sulky about the whole thing. Like They just are bitter. At any rate, they let it go. Okay. Uh, so afterwards the american colonies have to figure out what they're going to do um, and this is where you see a very distinctive and different approach to revolution than you're going to find really elsewhere in the world the people who had organized the american revolution against britain were as i mentioned earlier people who were already influential people who were accustomed to uh, governing in the colonies prior to the war they were large landowners they had a lot of vested interest in the status quo and so when they decide what to do to shape a government, their motivations are going to be influenced by that. They're not looking to shake up the whole world. They're not looking to overturn society the way that it worked before. They are really very much looking for a way to implement some of these revolutionary ideas, these uh, notions of uh, democracy. It's not really true democracy in the way that ancient Greece had, for instance, but the idea that you could institute a republic where people voted um, and that is how elected officials would be chosen, um, that kind of thing consent of the governed, all those beautiful enlightenment ideas. These are revolutionary, but it's meant to be set up by the leaders of the American Revolution in a way that is not too upsetting, not too challenging to the way things had always worked. Uh, and so in 1789, they get together to uh, create a constitution, this is the Constitutional Convention. Prior to that, during the entire war effort and in the years uh, subsequent after the Treaty was, of Paris was signed, uh, what had been the law of the land was something called the Articles of Confederation. 
it was a very loose um, alliance, really, between the 13 original colonies that sort of united them for the purposes of military action, but it, it didn't really have much in the way of a strong centralized government. There really hadn't been a lot of details hammered out. It wasn't functioning as a full government after the, the war was concluded. So in 1789, Constitutional Convention was formed, uh, and a debate uh, raged around it over whether to have a strong central government or a decentralized government to create, in essence, 13 kind of individual small states that were just loosely allied with each other for purposes of military defense and that kind of thing. Uh, the two sides were known as the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists. Um, Alexander Hamilton was a very prominent Federalist. Um, and they get into a debate with each other. And ultimately, at the convention, when they put it to a vote, the Federalists are going to win. They'll craft a constitution that organizes a strong centralized government, creating one nation, in essence, out of the 13 states. There's a whole bunch of compromise positions that have to be arranged at. Again, if you take an American history class, you'll cover this in loving detail. So I'm just skimming over it at this point. But what I will point out for you right now is something very crucial to note. When the leaders of the Constitutional Convention hammer out what they want the Constitution to be, they lay out all the kind of legal details of how they want the government organized. But what it doesn't initially contain is a Bill of Rights. And when they are finished with this process, when they've hammered out the Constitution, now will be the test. They have to send it out to the colonies to see if these now states will ratify it or not. And even before they let it out of the building, there was an outcry because it didn't contain a Bill of Rights. There's nothing in it guaranteeing uh, individuals legal rights and protections uh, sort of against and above uh, what the government uh, would do. And that was something that was crucially important to Enlightenment philosophy. It's this idea that the individual uh, has natural rights that need to be preserved and the only real government is one that protects those rights. And so uh, legislators and leaders of various states uh, immediately complain. They're like, we're not signing this unless it has a Bill of Rights. And so the first 10 amendments to the Constitution uh, are drawn up even before it goes around to be circulated to uh, be ratified. Uh, these first 10 amendments are spell out the Bill of Individual Rights that people have uh, and are entitled to. But I just want to point out that the people who got together to create the Constitution in the first place did not see that as a priority. They're putting it down the list. They get to it, but they put it well down the list as to what they see as their purpose and their job and their, their kind of motivation for creating this Constitution. Uh, the individual rights, the Bill of Rights, is something that is kind of second fiddle. That's going to be in real contrast to what we see happen with the next major revolutionary movement, the French. Bum, bum, bum. Now, in France, now we're backing up just a few years to 1775, um, this just the year before uh, the Declaration of Independence. Um, the French have a totally different approach to revolution. It's going to be uh, motivated by different reasons. It's going to be organized by a different style of person, a different kind of person. And the demands of the revolution are going to be very different. The war itself is going to play out very differently. It's going to be different up one side and down another. In 1775, you see the, uh, the early, I guess, um, hints, the foreshadowing as to what's about to come. There are serious riots in the city of Paris known as the Flower Wars. And the reason they're called the Flower Wars is because there had been a series of bad harvests and there had been some serious problems and uh, flour uh, was short. There was a shortage of flour in particular, of food, particularly wheat flour. And this was particularly bad because uh, in Paris, the people who were the working class, the poor, were living uh, on not a particularly varied or rich diet. Most of their calories were coming from bread. And uh, bread would be the cheapest thing that was available in terms of feeding people enough to keep them alive. Um, and so when the price of bread starts going up and up and up because the price of flour starts going up and up and up, what happens is that people who had been living on bread no longer have a food they're capable of buying to live off of and they start going hungry. Hungry people become violent people 
very quickly. It's an enormously dangerous situation. And this circles back to something uh, that uh, was relevant from your Adam Smith reading. Now, he doesn't talk about the flower wars in particular, more is the pity. But the reason it's relevant uh, has to do with the fact that Adam Smith's ideas, now if you remember, if you read some of the Wealth of Nations, what he talks about in there are the natural laws that govern economics. And specifically, the one we're all familiar with is the law of supply and demand that the market will balance itself. That's Adam Smith's idea. So that um, if there's a high demand for flour, people will start growing more uh, wheat and they'll produce more and it will balance out. And so ultimately the price will level out where it is most logical. The problem with applying Adam Smith's ideas to something like flour in Paris is that uh, it doesn't necessarily work in practice as well as it does in theory. Uh, and Adam Smith himself understood this. I don't mean to imply that he didn't. He warns about the dangers of monopoly and he warns about the problems of commodity production. Uh, but many of the people who were reading Adam Smith's ideas, including the King of France, were less clear than they might have been and exactly what he was saying and how this might play out in reality. It's true that market forces and the law of supply and demand do tend to create a leveling effect eventually and that it may be an efficient way to run an economy in the long run. The problem has to do when you are talking about something with a limited supply and you're talking about something that people can't simply opt not to buy. And that's what happens in Paris. There's not enough flour, there's not enough bread, and so people start going hungry. They can't simply wait until the price of flour comes down. They're hungry now. And the political reality is that you can't wait for the economy to simply level off. You have to do something immediately. And yet, uh, because of their massive, in 1775, budget shortfalls, empty treasuries, all kinds of financial problems. The King of France had experimented. He'd chosen this terrible moment to try to experiment with re removing the subsidy that traditionally had controlled the price of grain. He was hoping that the laws of supply and demand would take care of that for him, moving away from something like mercantilism like they used uh, under Louis XIV. He was hoping that would work out but it doesn't. It backfires horribly. There are food shortages. There are riots. There are people in the streets breaking up, as you can see from the, the cartoon here, breaking up bakeries, but also uh, rioting up to the palace and complaining constantly. Uh, they want some. They want the king to do something for them. They're hungry. They're desperate. They're angry. They're violent. They're already living on the edge. They're already living on almost starvation. And so the least little thing is pushing them over and they're pushing them right in into violent riots and rebellions. And this is going to be the core, in many ways, of the French Revolutionary Movement and why it is so different from the American Revolutionary Movement. The French Revolution is going to swell out of the working class and the grievances that the working class have against a hereditary monarchy, which they didn't have in the American colonies, uh, and the grievances that they have against the terrible economic inequality and social inequality that they face every day. That is going to be the prime driving motive. And so because this is a very different approach, it's going to play out in a very different way. Okay, so the rest of this slide. You can see there's a painting, lovely painting of Marie Antoinette here. Uh, she's the queen. She's married to Louis XVI um, of France. And she becomes kind of the, I wouldn't say scapegoat. It's not the, as though she has no responsibility at all. But she ends up being the focus of a lot of the rage that the starving mob of Paris starts to feel. In part because Marie Antoinette was a princess. She comes from Austria. She uh, is accustomed to living high on the hog in Austria even before she marries into the French royal family. Then she marries into a royal family that's very much unequal to the challenges that they're currently facing. The treasury is empty. Everything is going to pot. Things are going badly. Um, and they only make it worse, by the way, by spending a ton of money on the American Revolution. 
And meanwhile, while the treasury is empty and people are hungry and there's not enough food to go around, she's traipsing around in beautiful gowns and fabulous huge uh, jewelry dripping all everywhere and uh, trying to live in the style of Louis XIV, trying to live in the great palace of the Sun King and live like things are still going great, but they're not. And so she ends up being this target for the rage, the frustration that so many people feel. They feel it politically. They would like more more say, some say, over their political lives. They feel it economically. They feel like they're trapped in poverty where they're starving almost to death and they can't get out of it and they want something to happen. They feel it on all these levels. And she ends up being a target of that. And so there are very vulgar cartoons uh, that are drawn about her and circulated all over Paris. And the government tries to quash them, but they don't really succeed. It's really bad. And she ends up becoming a focus of a lot of rage. Okay. So here's what happens in 1789. It comes to a head. Um, the treasury, they are just broke, absolutely broke. They've got no money in France. And the only way they can get out of it is by an emergency tax move. This is always unpopular, always, always, always. It's uh, the worst thing you can do or be stuck having to do is have to raise taxes unexpectedly as a government. And when you're in that boat, we've already talked about this with Britain, what happens when you suddenly have to raise taxes is that you have to get consensus for it. You have to get people to agree to go along with you for these emergency measures. And this, if you're a king, opens you up tremendously. You become politically very vulnerable. Now, the people who are going to agree or refuse you in your emergency financial situation have the chance to press for reform. They have a chance to press for what demands they want. And so that's what happens in France. In France, they're desperate. They need money. They need to do something. The government's on the brink of collapse. They've got to come up with something. And so the King of France summons the Estates General. The Estates General an institute, it's a medieval institution. It goes way back in France. Hadn't been summoned in more than a hundred years because they've been doing that whole absolute monarchy thing. Uh, but what it's supposed to be. It's this medieval institution where you get consensus by gathering representation of all of the people in France. That's what it theoretically is supposed to be. And so there should be representatives to uh, each estate. Now, I would write this on the board, I suppose, uh, if we had one. But there are three estates in the Estates General. The first estate is the clergy. That's just how they organized it. Um, and that's really obvious who's going to represent the clergy. Uh, France is a Catholic country exclusively and official means at this point. There are Protestants who live in France, but uh, for the most part, uh, Catholicism is legally the official religion. And so it's really easy to know who's going to represent the first estate in the Estates General uh, because the Catholic clergy have a hierarchy and they will simply appoint the upper clergy to uh, attend the Estates General meeting and represent the Catholic Church's interests there. The second estate is the nobility. And again, there's a built-in hierarchy. They already know who's going to represent the nobility. So every region in France has whoever their highest noble is, and they know that that person will be chosen to be the representative to the estates general, and they're going to show up at the meeting hall and represent the interests of the nobility. And then the third estate is everybody else. Now, there are a fair number of clergy in France, and there are a fair number of nobles. So the estates general third estate represents um, eh, somewhere between 70 and 80 percent of all people in France, uh, but it nevertheless is a huge, it's the overwhelming majority of people and the people of least privilege. Now, not everybody in the third estate is poor. Uh, people who were not noble, they didn't have a title, uh, but were middle class, people who were wealthy, would fall into that third estate as well. So it's kind of important to represent that it, it is both everybody from the poorest of the poor right up to very wealthy bankers, etc. But it's everybody who isn't clergy and isn't nobility. It is a medieval institution. Now, traditionally, this is how the Estates General worked. The king would have some kind of emergency. They'd summon the Estates General representatives of the clergy would show up, representatives of the nobility would show up, then there'd be some kind of process to choose who would be the representatives of the third estate. Usually it would be done regionally, so uh, anything like a county-wide chunk uh, department of France would be chosen, and then uh, there'd be a way for people to kind of 
choose who they wanted their representative to be. Often it would be like the mayor of a town or it would be something along those lines. And so the representatives of the third estate would show up as well. And traditionally what happened was this, there'd be a meeting, you'd have all the representatives cram in, the king would then say, I really need money for this war against whatever, usually it was war. Um, uh, so there you go, this is what I need. And what happened every time before 1789, what happened every stinking time is that a vote would be held and that each estate would get one vote. So the clergy would get one vote, the nobility would get one vote, and everybody else would get one vote. And if you remember how things worked in the Middle Ages, the clergy and nobility were basically the same people. And so what happened every stinking time was the clergy and nobility would just outvote everybody else and be like, sorry, you're in the minority, what can I say? Even though they represented 70 to 80% of the population, they couldn't outvote the clergy and nobility combined. And so that's traditionally what happened. What happens this time is different. Now it's been a hundred years since anybody summoned the Estates General. Now the nobility's rights have been eroded by absolute monarchy. The clergy are no longer as uh, hand in glove with the monarchy as once they were, because once again, the idea of absolute monarchy is the idea of not sharing power. And so the church is mad. It's after the uh, Protestant Re uh, Reformation. They're, they're not really necessarily as comfortable as they once were acting as the kind of patsy of the king anymore. And so uh, it doesn't go as cleanly and as easily as before. First of all, there's going to be a huge debate over how they're going to choose the representatives to the Estates General. Then, once they've uh, more or less settled on that, there's going to be an immediate debate over what the Estates General is going to try to accomplish. What are they going to try to get out of the king? And then further... Uh, the third estate in particular, those who are chosen, those who are ultimately going to show up for the Estates General, have an immediate um, agenda and have an immediate debate that they are going to put forward on how the whole structure of the Estates General should function. They're going to demand initially and early on that instead of uh, the vote going as it traditionally did, where the nobility get a vote, the clergy get a vote, and, and everybody else gets one vote. They're like, no, 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 we want the vote to go by population. And so if we're 80% of the population, we want 80% of the vote. We want it to go like that. We don't want it to be one estate, one vote anymore. And so there's a, this fierce debate about it. And so the king summons the estates general. They show up. Immediately it turns into chaos where they're arguing and fighting and debating over exactly how the estates general is even going to work, how the votes are going to be counted, what they're going to try to accomplish. And it gets so um, out of control that the king starts to panic a little. He's like, oh, shoot, this is not going the way I wanted. I just was hoping for emergency measures to raise some money. I knew I'd probably have to make some kind of legal concessions, but this is, I don't even know what's going to happen here. So he orders them to adjourn. He's like, okay, we're going to have a recess. Everybody go home and calm down. We're going to try this again next week, but leave. Um, we're not having this meeting if you're going to get this much out of control. Well, the third estate isn't going to listen to that. They refuse to be dismissed. And so rather than going home or cooling off for a time, they uh, are then going to look for a new place to rally. Um, and they end up uh, kind of mobbing down the street looking for some kind of building that's big enough for everybody to get inside so they can still have their meeting. They ultimately find a tennis court. At the time, tennis was a different sort of game. It was kind of like racquetball on a bigger scale. And so it would be fought inside and the walls came into play. It's a long story. But at any rate, they find one of these tennis courts and they all go inside and they start giving speeches and they uh, try to come to some kind of consensus about what it is they want. And in this tennis court in 1789, the leaders of the third estate basically come to a consensus. They decide they want uh, a constitution. They want limits to the monarchy. And they decide and declare and swear as the tennis court oath, we will not go home. We won't be dismissed until we get a constitution. We are determined that things have to change in France. They can't continue as they are. We're legally, we have an absolute monarchy. We refuse to accept it anymore. We are not bailing out the treasury unless we get legal reform and we want it and we want it now. Now, traditionally, as I mentioned, uh, the Estates General 
broke out where the nobility and clergy would side together against everybody else. This changes in 1789. The clergy, I don't know if you can see this in the center of that picture, the clergy breaks ranks. They decide at this stage in 1789 that their interests and their obligations align more firmly with the third estate than they do with the monarchy or the nobility. And so the clergy also cross the line and take the tennis court oath and form a broad alliance with the third estate to demand constitutional reform in France. Okay, so what happens then is that the third estates and the estate general uh, reform into something called the National Assembly. And as the National Assembly, they're insisting on the establishment of a constitution that's supposed to be hammered out. Um, and they want the king to uh, knuckle under, basically. They want the king to work with them to come up with some kind of a constitutional monarchy the way Britain has. The king, uh, because he's an idiot, panics. And instead of just working with them or cooperating or accepting that there needs to be a path to constitutional monarchy, he calls in the army to try to attack the National Assembly. There's massive rioting uh, in Paris as a result. The rioters, who are made up some of the sort of estates general people themselves, but also largely by this mob of working class, angry, furious people in France, they're going to storm through the city and attack the royal fortress of the Bastille. The Bastille is a royal fortress, as I mentioned. Uh, there were rumors at the time that it was housing uh, some weapons, that that's where there were a weapons collection inside. It also was a place where they would put political prisoners. And so the Bastille is attacked, guards are overwhelmed, the place is broken into and you know, smashed and burned, etc., shot with cannons and so forth. Um, and political prisoners are released. There weren't any weapons inside, sadly. Uh, but by attacking this royal fortress, this ends up being the kind of official beginning of the war. It's very much like the Lexington and Concord shots. Um, this happens on July 14th, 1789. That ends up being the, uh, the fireworks day, the Independence Day for, for uh, France that will later be celebrated. It's known as the Bastille Day. Anyway, so they attack the Bastille. The king uh, is uh, freaking out at this point. He's not exactly sure how to respond with the army. Uh, his initial attempts to respond are overwhelmed. And then the king has to uh, subside and agree. He ends up um, entering into negotiations with the National Assembly. The National Assembly is going to publish something called the Declaration of the Rights of Man. This is their response. Uh, to this entire uh, storming of the Bastille and the army response and their own role as the Estates General and trying to establish a new constitution. And the first thing they issue was one of our readings, it'll be one of our readings for this week, is a document known as the Declaration of the Rights of Man and the Citizen. It really is, if you read through it, uh, very strikingly similar to the Bill of Rights. It's similar in some ways in its language to the Declaration of Independence, but really where the Declaration of Independence, where Jefferson wrote that, that was a statement of enlightenment principles, but then a whole lot of specific grievances that uh, the King of England had evidently uh, visited upon the American colonists. The Declaration of the Rights of Man is very different. It really is a bill of rights spelling out what people have a right to expect from their government and what they will accept and what they won't. This is meant to be the framework for a new constitution in France. And I just want to point out the contrast. When the American revolutionaries ultimately sit down some years after the war is concluded to hammer out a constitution, the Bill of Rights was the afterthought the first 10 amendments to the Constitution. When the French sit down, and they're not even sitting, half of them are standing on their feet shouting at this point, when they gather to put together a Constitution, the first thing they think about is the Bill of Rights. And this very much encapsulates the two very distinct approaches to revolution in uh, the what will be the United States and in France. In France, there really is a desire and a drive to overturn the structures of society in the way that they currently worked. They want to see social justice, they want to see political justice, they want to see economic justice, and they see their own uh, country and their culture as 
currently before the revolution really thwarting that and standing in its way they see the need to overturn society in a fundamental way in a way that american revolutionaries really did not and this is going to extend to some really quite uh, radical social revolutionary movements in addition to being political revolutionary movements the declaration of the rights of man is going to spell out it uses enlightenment language up one side and down another and it's going to spell out the natural rights of of mankind uh, almost initially, uh, immediately, uh, once this is published, there is going to be a big outcry in Paris from women who feel that it doesn't do enough. They don't really have any quab uh, quibbles uh, with what's contained in the Declaration, but what they don't like is that it doesn't specifically specify that, uh, sorry, that's redundant, but it doesn't specify that women are included in this. And women are going to be a very important part of the French revolutionary movement from the very beginning. Uh, they were the organizers of some of the flower wars, the great riots in Paris. They're going to be uh, in the crowd when they're storming the Bastille. Women are going to see this revolutionary movement as an opportunity, not just to express their economic anger uh, about starving in Paris, but also uh, to express their anger about their legal status. Um, if men didn't have many rights under an absolute monarchy, women had even fewer. Legally, they were uh, sort of treated as the property of their husbands or fathers. They could sort of be moved as either of them sort of desired. Uh, children were automatically, if the, a couple were to split up for any reason, were automatically given to the father. Uh, men had the right legally to beat their wives if they wanted to. Uh, women did not have the right to control their own property and marriage. And all of these things upset women uh, in France and elsewhere, one assumes. Uh, but in France, this revolutionary movement was perceived as an opportunity not just for working class men to achieve a more fair and, uh, I guess, balanced future, but a chance for women as well to throw off the... Um, the sort of traditional legal restrictions on their lives. And so in 1789, there's going to be an outcry of organized women who are upset that the Declaration of the Rights of Man doesn't go far enough in guaranteeing their own participation in this movement. There's going to be a march um, to Versailles. So 1789, July was when the Declaration of the Rights of Man comes out. By October, women are organizing, and it did take some organization, to march to Versailles to demand to be heard by the king. The king is still in residence at Versailles at this point. It's uh, about 13 miles outside Paris itself, and so they had to organize and get their whole like rabbly crowd together and march 13 miles down to Versailles. And you can see from this cartoon here, some of them are dragging cannons, etc., and waving weapons. Uh, they didn't do this to attack the palace. They just went down there so they could create a big uh, demonstration, force the king to be aware of them. And what they demand when they organize this march to Versailles is that the king... Uh, refuse to sign any new constitution unless it guarantees the rights of women as well as men. Okay, so there are various influences inside the French Revolution. Not everybody is on the same page at the same time. Uh, the radical branch uh, are known as the Jacobin, and um, they are sometimes also referred to the, the working class uh, is sometimes also referred to as the sans-culottes, people who don't have those culottes or those short pants. Um, you can see on the illustration on the right, um, there's a, it's another cartoon. Cartoons were enormously uh, politically influential and, and very telling and, and good at encapsulating the situation that's going on at this point. So I've got tons of them to show you. At any rate, if you can see the cartoon that's there on the right, what that's supposed to capture is the three estates. So you have the guy in his clergy outfit there who's sitting in the front on top of that old man who's bent over with his wooden shoes, his sabot, um, and then sitting on his back um, are the clergy and the nobility in his fancy outfit with his feathered cap, etc. And they're both just kind of riding on the back of the third estate. That's what it's supposed to capture and supposed to uh, express. Uh, but what you can see on um, all, well, all of those gentlemen, really, 
are what we refer to as the culotte. So it's the short pants that come, those kind of like knickers that come to the, the uh, knee, and then you would have hose underneath uh, theirs covering your lower leg. Well, working class men didn't wear those because they're not very practical. You would uh, rip up your stockings if you were to walk around like that trying to work on a farm in that way. What they wore is what the guy on the left has, trousers. And so it becomes a mark of status that you belong to like the real revolutionaries, the real working class to call yourself the sans culotte. I don't have those short pants. I'm a working man. I've got the, the pants on. Um, so at any rate, uh, the radical side of the French Revolution uh, is going to argue and, and um, advocate for really broad social and economic change. They want uh, the traditional uh, privileges of the aristocracy to be eliminated. And those traditional privileges include everything from exemption from taxation. Traditional uh, nobles didn't pay taxes. Uh, instead, they had the opportunity to serve as local magistrates. They uh, had a bunch of responsibilities. They were supposed to serve in the army. That's not necessarily happening anymore. Uh, but they had all these rights and responsibilities, but they didn't really pay taxes. Um, and the sans culotte want that to change. They also uh, want all the sort of traditional privileges to be gone as well. In France, there were a lot of jobs that were only really open to people who had titles. If you wanted to be the governor of New France or you wanted to be uh, in charge of a whole variety of different governmental departments, you had to be in this noble class of person. That's where all the plum jobs went. And so uh, those who are on the radical side say, we want all of that changed. We want the titles of nobility abolished, in fact. We want there to be no privileges for some people over others. Everybody should be equal under the law. Uh, along those same lines, they advocate for economic change. They would like to see um, this situation that has resulted in the poor being extremely poor uh, on the brink of starvation and the rich being extremely rich with their palaces and gold covered everything and their silk clothes and everything super expensive and they just got so much money they would like to see that changed and they'd like to see something more like equality economically as well as socially okay so this starts to happen. In 1790, the titles of nobility are abolished in France. Uh, so technically there are no lords anymore. Uh, they don't necessarily give up these titles. This also by 1790 begins a massive kind of wave of exodus. You have um, nobles beginning to sense where the wind is blowing and they're starting to leave France in largish numbers at this point. They're gathering up their valuables and if they're smart they're getting out. Not everybody's out yet but they're on their way. Um, and so they're going to start uh, gathering up resistance. Some of them are going to leave France, go into exile in places like England, Austria, elsewhere and start talking to monarchs and nobles in those countries worrying about what's going on in France trying to stir the pot against the dangers of this French Revolution and what it might mean to everybody and it didn't take a lot of stirring elsewhere in Europe wherever there are monarchies there was a great deal of fear that the French Revolution was going to create a domino effect and take everybody else down as well and so all of that's going on everybody's whispering in their ear and so in 1790 the titles of nobility are abolished but also, this is an important key moment, they pass something, the National Assembly passed something called the Civil Constitution of the Clergy. What it was aimed at was the traditional relationship between the nobility and the clergy and this sort of semi-hierarchical, semi-hereditary, I mean, it's not really hereditary, but it's, we have noble families all in every pot in both the clergy and in the nobility. Um, and so what the civil constitution of the clergy basically says is that no longer will the Pope and the cardinals and the bishops and the hierarchy have the right to appoint priests to uh, be the leaders of your uh, local church. Instead, local communities will have the right to vote over who they want to be their priest um, and to be their pastor in their local area. Um, and so as you can imagine, 
this really offends the Catholic Church. That's not how they've worked for millennia. It's not how they intend to work now. And this effort to interfere of secular government interfering in the way the church runs, they've had this fight in the past and the church is not about to back down from it. And so what happens is that you start to see a rupture between that first estate and the third estate. They had joined temporarily as allies, but now the Catholic Church sees a serious problem and potential danger of the French Revolution. It's getting too radical for them, and it's going to be not just the Catholic clergy, but there are a number of people in France who start to feel this way as well, especially outside the city of Paris. Paris is where everything is the most um, radical. It's where everything is the most uh, extreme and where the most uh, kind of radical changes to uh, politics and to the economic life are really being pushed for. Outside Paris, there's a good deal of skepticism about whether all of this is really a good idea. We'll get back to that. Also, in 1789, there was a movement to move the royal family out of Versailles. Because Versailles is uh, some 13 miles or so outside the city of Paris, um, it was considered that the royal family was perhaps a little too far out to be adequately observed and controlled. And so they're forced to move into the city of Paris itself to stay at the Palace of the Tuileries. It's not exactly a hardship to stay at the Tuileries, but what it meant was that they would be much more under the thumb and much more under the direct observation of the National Assembly. This was considered necessary because all the rest of the monarchs in Europe were agitated by this whole French Revolution. They were starting to pull together armies, massing on borders, thinking about what they might do. Um, and Marie Antoinette, for instance, her brother is the Emperor of Austria. There was a, a deal of uncertainty as to whether the, the royal family was going to go along with this or whether they were opposing a threat to the revolution. And so as a proactive measure, they're moved into the city of Paris where they are much more under the thumb of the National Assembly and the crowd. Okay, so the royal family makes a terrible mistake at this point. Um, in 1791, they attempt to flee the country. They become so nervous about what might happen to them that uh, rather than staying to try to negotiate any further, they decide they're going to make a break for it and flee to Marie Antoinette's brother in Austria to try to rally any supporters, any royalists who are loyal to the, the crown and get them all together to come and attack France from the outside. That was the long term goal. So the royal family stages their escape. They come up with disguises. They have ordinary clothes and they get a coach together. And this, of course, is a terrible way. If you're trying to sneak out of the country, getting in like a coach and six horses is a terrible way to do it because you're very conspicuous. Um, also, so they get in the coach and their disguises. They make a run for the border. They head out secretly, secretly, uh, and they make it all the way to the border with Austria, at which point they are observed, caught and stopped. And the reason they are caught, the person who catches them after all that time, is a postmaster, is a guy who runs the mail. And of course, this makes complete and perfect sense that a postmaster is the one who catches them because the postmaster is the one who looks at portraits and uh, does the business of the king all the time. So here he is on the Austrian border. Coach goes by. He looks up and is like, hey that's the king. And so they are caught. And this is a disaster for Louis the 16th and Marie Antoinette. They're caught attempting to escape. They're no longer considered a safe bet anymore. They're dragged back to Paris. And essentially a debate is had in the National Assembly about what to do about them. And in this debate, things start to get really nasty. Um, the radical phase of the French Revolution sort of begins at this point. There's a, a, a whole argument about what to do with the royal family. And in this argument, the people who are on the more radical side get the upper hand. And they argue that the royal family can't be trusted, that they're going to always call on their relatives and their friends outside the country to come and attack France. This is only made worse by the fact that Austria does in fact declare war on the French revolutionary government. Prussia does as well. And so the French uh, Republic 
the National Assembly has to call on their own troops. And this is a test of truth. This is a moment where nobody's sure what's going to happen. But shockingly to the world, the French revolutionary government calls on the, the army, and the army for the most part shows up. It's the same army that once served the king. And some of the commanders, some of the people who are in the high uh, command structure, people who were nobles, people who had tight connections with the royal family, do uh, sort of, I guess, defect, uh, flee the country, end up not serving in the army. But most of the rank and file troops remember that armies had been made up of working class people for years and years at this point. Uh, most of the, the rank and file troops do show up and they cobble together uh, what equipment that they have and they pull themselves into order and they uh, reorganize their command structure and they fight against the Austrians and the Prussians on the border and shockingly, they're successful. They repel several attempts at invasion, they win a whole bunch of battles and it gets this huge morale boost for the French Republic. At the same time, they're desperately afraid they can't trust the royal family at this point. Something has to be done. And so in 1791, the decision is going to be made uh, that uh, the royal family has to be dealt with. At the same time, making things even more tense, there are revolutionary movements elsewhere. Uh, in 1791, Poland is going to rise up, declare independence from any of the neighbors that were trying to claim this territory. Prussia, Austria, and Russia all have their little claims in. They declare independence, come up with their own constitution, and declare that they are going to be their own republic with a representative government. This is how they're gonna do things from now on. Immediately, Russia, Austria, and Prussia declare war on Poland, invade, and overwhelm Polish forces, and then divide Poland up into chunks. You can see from the map here. The blue is uh, Prussian claims, green Russia, uh, well, the minty green color is uh, Russia, and that limey green color are Austrian claims. They're going to swoop in, claim parts of Poland, divvy it up amongst themselves, and fight amongst themselves over how big a piece each gets. But this movement, this declaration of independence and the establishment of a constitution, illustrates to Prussia and Austria and Russia just how dangerous these potential revolutionary movements are. Uh, the same thing is happening in Britain, even though I have a slide for that. In Britain, you have also people clamoring for political reform. They already have a constitutional monarchy, but there's a great deal of pressure. Britain is hovering on the cusp of revolution as well. They want more rights uh, for people to vote. They want more uh, kind of economic equality. They want uh, less traditional noble privilege. They want all of those things in Britain as well as they want them elsewhere in Europe. And so this is just a moment of tremendous uncertainty. There's revolutions springing up all over the place. You have monarchs who are desperate to try to crush those movements. It's just all very thrilling. Okay, same dealio. 1791. Inspired by the revolution in France, Toussaint Louverture is going to lead a rebellion on the island of Saint-Domingue. It's a French colony uh, island. It's known as Santo Domingo by the French, or rather by the Spanish, and Saint-Domingue by the French. Uh, it's the island that is now divided between Haiti and the Dominican Republic. And so what happens is there's this really, well, starting backing up to start over a little bit. Um, Toussaint Louverture is this fascinating figure. If we had time, we could do a whole lecture just on him. Um, but uh, he is just astonishing. He was born a slave. Uh, he was educated somehow. His biography is a little unclear. Uh, he was educated somehow. He could read and write. He spoke several languages and he was brilliant by every uh, stretch of the imagination. And he was uh, technically legally free in 1791. And when he hears about the French Revolution, especially this radical phase of the French Revolution that talked about liberty and justice and equality for all men, he thinks to himself, well, you know who that should include? Everyone, including people who are currently enslaved in French territory. And so he's going to lead a rebellion um, and on uh, the uh, Western part of the island, the French part of the island. Um, in order to free slaves uh, from their owners and plantations uh, on that part and create an emancipated free republic instead. So he organizes this and his political maneuvering then becomes quite complicated. So I'm going to try to simplify it for you a little bit. 
initially he is going to correspond with the French National Assembly and say, you're right, I totally agree with your message, I totally agree with the right of all people to be free, and that of course includes us, right? People who are currently enslaved. And then there's this awkward pause where the National Assembly has to think for a minute because they're like, wait, did we mean slaves? Um, I Well, in principle, yes, but practically speaking, this could end up costing us money. We're not really sure what we're going to do. And so there's this kind of hesitation. And in the meantime, Toussaint Louverture is like, oh, not going to support me, huh? Well, too bad. And so he organizes the rebellion anyway, and he cooperates with the Spanish on the eastern side of the island. The Spanish cut him a deal, basically saying, as long as you keep the rebellion from spreading to the Spanish side of the island, we will help you with supplies, and we'll help you with support, and we'll just generally help you out so that you can be successful in the West. And so Toussaint Louverture takes this deal initially. Finally, however, in 1793, the revolutionary government comes off the fence and it's like, no, you're right, Toussaint Louverture. You're right about the whole slavery thing, incompatible with our new uh, state, incompatible with our, our ideals of liberty and equality for everyone. So we're not going to have that. We declare that everyone in French territory is now legally emancipated and that slavery is illegal. At which point Toussaint Louverture says, sweet, if that's going to be your attitude, well then, sorry Spanish, I'm siding with the French again, I'm going to switch allegiances because they truly have uh, the kind of moral high ground here. And so from there, he's going to organize uh, the French side and with French support, he's going to overwhelm the rest of the island and take the whole thing over and declare the entire island to be emancipated and create a free republic of Saint-Domingue. Uh, the French National Assembly officially uh, is not only going to abolish all slavery, but they're going to recognize Toussaint Louverture's success and name him governor of Saint-Domingue as a result of this. And so they create a free republic. This is the only, as far as I know, this is the only successful slave rebellion in the Americas. It starts as a rebellion. They overwhelm uh, government forces. They take over the island and they establish a free republic um, with Toussaint Louverture as the governor. Uh, he's going to have a difficult end of life. Um, he's going to rule as the governor for some years, and then uh, this is foreshadowing ahead of where we're going to get in lecture today, but uh, ultimately he's going to come running up against Napoleon. But in the meantime, Toussaint Louverture is training generals to work under him. He's organizing a new state and a new government on the island, and he's going to establish a, a lasting change that is not going to be undone even by Napoleon. We'll get to him in just a minute. So, era of revolution rolls on. Okay. 1793, a decision is made about uh, the royal family. After a fierce debate, and fears of backlash, like they had with the English Civil War, uh, the decision is made to get rid of the royal family, that they're too much of a danger, that as long as they're alive, people are going to rally behind them and possibly threaten the success of the French Revolution. And so the royal family is going to be imprisoned. And then later uh, that same year, Louis XVI is going to be executed by guillotine. We'll talk about the guillotine in just a second. Uh, and a few months later, Marie Antoinette will also be executed. They do have children. Uh, the children are never executed. They are going to survive for a while. Um, and they're not going to be killed by the government ever at any point. But both um, the king and the queen are going to be executed. And from here on out, from 1793, this phase of the French Revolution becomes known as the Reign of Terror. This is where it gets really radical. The government has a whole bunch of goals. Some of them are really popular, and these have been the goals of the National Assembly from the very beginning. The abolishment of the titles of nobility, very popular move. Uh, opening all jobs and government positions to all people, very popular move. In addition to that, the idea of uh, creating a system of free public education for all children was promoted by the National Assembly, very popular. They haven't implemented it because that takes organization and money and time, and they have not been able to pull that to off, but that was the goal. Uh, also, in addition to that, there were all these promises about revamping the postal system, changing the structure of government so that everybody would have a chance to participate, and all of these grand plans only the most, uh, I guess, basic of them. They did abolish the titles of nobility. 
Uh, nobles at this point, if they're still in France, are fleeing as fast as they can, and the estates they leave behind are being looted uh, by the common population and by the National Assembly, if uh, the common population haven't gotten to them yet, uh, left and right. Um, so all of that's happening, um, and yet some of the more positive, organized promises of the revolution have not really come to pass. Uh, economic equality, for instance. Uh, things are still tough in France. They are constantly short of money. The government is scraping to try to make ends meet just to keep the army afield and paid. They can't really offer much in the way of economic relief for most people. Um, in addition to that, there's nowhere, they're nowhere close to being able to put together an educational system, even revamping the, the legal system. Is, it just all takes time and money, and they haven't had it yet. And so people are beginning to chafe. They're beginning to feel impatient because the promises of the revolution have not really been delivered. But in the reign of terror, the demands of the revolution get ever higher. Anybody who speaks out against it, who is like, I don't know if some of these changes are really a good idea. For instance, the civil constitution of the clergy or uh, kind of the break with the Catholic Church. Anybody who speaks out against it runs the risk of being denounced as an enemy of the revolution. And if they're denounced as an enemy of the revolution, they could end up meeting the same fate as the king. They could end up on the guillotine. Now, the guy who is spearheading this phase is a fellow by the name of Maximilien Robespierre. There he is there. Um, and Robespierre, he was known in his day as the incorruptible. And he earns this name by being uh, somebody who is a true believer. He believes in the, the changes of the revolution and trying to create liberty, equality, fraternity. That was the, the call of the French Revolution for everyone. And that it was something that should apply to everyone. And the only way this is going to happen, he realizes, is if you quash any resistance uh, to these changes that have to be made. And so this is where Robespierre becomes a monster, I guess, it's probably not unfair to call him this, is that anybody who stands in the way, anybody who steps up and is like, I don't know if I really think this is a great idea, uh, ends up on a list to be executed. And thousands of people will be declared, on relatively little evidence, enemies of the revolution and executed. If you were noble and you're still in France in 1793, you could end up guillotined simply for being noble, not actually having done anything. Um, if you were somebody who had spoken too strongly in favor of nobles, if you were somebody who spoke out saying, I don't think we ought to kill the king, you could be in danger and end up executed. The quote that I have here from Robespierre is a, a brilliant I guess, illustration of his views. Now, the reason he's called the incorruptible is because he couldn't be bribed. He couldn't be swayed. He couldn't be persuaded against doing what he felt was right. Unfortunately, what he felt was right was killing a lot of people, but he couldn't be turned off that path. Uh, and he would justify it by saying something along the lines of, if virtue be the spring of a popular government in times of peace, the spring of that government during a revolution is virtue combined with terror. Virtue without which terror is destructive, terror without which virtue is impotent. Terror is only justice, prompt, severe, and inflexible. It is then an emanation of virtue. It is less a distinct principle than a natural consequence of the general principle of democracy applied to the most pressing wants of the country. The government in a revolution is the despotism of liberty against tyranny. So when people came to Robespierre and said, you can't just terrorize people, he's like, yes, I can, and I will. And it's for the good of everyone that I do that. This is just how it goes. Well, what kinds of changes were being made? The French Revolutionary government at this stage tries to undo everything. Not just the structure of the absolute monarchy, that had to go, obviously. Not just the traditional church, that had to go, obviously. Uh, but uh, they try to undo everything that reminded anybody about tradition or anything, really. They changed the calendar uh, because it was too entrenched in traditional uh, Greek and Roman references, Roman mostly, um, and because it was too much a tool of the old regime. And so they rename everything, and it was meant to be kind of scientific, but they rename all the months after the type of 
uh, whether you'd get in the months. They also move the, the dates so that it no longer would correspond to the original calendar. So um, for instance, uh, vintage uh, would be between September 22nd and October 21st. So kind of like that way. Uh, so each of these new months were named after the kind of weather you would get, like Romer, Vantos, Windy, etc. <laughs> and uh, yeah, Thermidor, which is hot, it's like August, <laughs> various points. So they renamed the months, they renamed the days of the week, because the days of the week were named after Roman gods, most of them. Um, and so they change everything that smacked of tradition. Now things like the, the months and the days of the week, that's slightly confusing if you're going to start using a new calendar. In addition to that, they try to promote things like metric time. You can see that clock that's down there on the bottom left. This, there was an effort to change the clocks so that instead of being a base 12, it would be a base 10. There's no reason for this. They just do it because, I don't know, they thought it was more sciency and less traditional. It didn't make a lot of sense. And as you can probably imagine, this went over like a lead balloon. People wanted a working post office. They wanted education for children. They wanted the uh, opportunity to work in government jobs. They did not want to change their clocks, especially outside of Paris. This just, just people were like, but I don't, I don't really want to do, this isn't accomplishing what I want. And so there becomes a great deal of frustration pushing back against the revolution at this point. Also, a great deal of anger because people are being rounded up and killed for not being revolutionary enough. And then you see in the top left, the guillotine ends up becoming a symbol for this moment in time. The guillotine was invented by a physician, um, Louis Guillotine, I believe, um, in France, largely as a result of this, uh, I guess, Enlightenment philosophy and Romanticism as well, we'll get to that next week, um, which argued that maybe exposing people in, to horrible violence and terrible cruelty was maybe not good for them psychologically and that it would be better to try to preserve people's innocence in a way. And so when you had to publicly execute people, and there was no real debate at this stage that people ought to be pub publicly executed if they were being executed at all, uh, rather than having a guy with an ax hack away at them, which could be gory and gruesome, and sometimes it took a few whacks to get their head off, and it was all very gross, uh, and there would be, you know, screaming and blood everywhere, instead of killing them horribly with like drawing and quartering or some other kind of cruel way, Maybe it would be better for the public if you could come up with a fail-safe, painless way to execute people. And so guillotine invented the guillotine. It's basically a frame where you have a, a piece of wood that will keep a person's neck in place, and then a weighted angled blade would be drawn up and then dropped using a trigger a string. And because it's heavy and because it's angled and quite sharp, it would neatly cut their head off every time, no problem. And uh, this would kill them almost instantly. Certainly it would sever their spine and they would feel no more pain. They would be fine. And so it was designed to be a more humane, painless way to execute people. It ends up becoming a symbol of terror because so many people are going to be lined up to be killed with this thing. It ends up being a murder machine in a sense. Uh, and so... Uh, the leaders of the radical revolution, this reign of terror, Robespierre and others, are going to round up anybody they perceive to be an enemy and have them executed. And so it's the guillotine, it's not always the guillotine, but the guillotine over and over and over again is just killing people and killing people and killing people. People become nervous, they become upset, they no longer trust the government, they're dissatisfied with what the French uh, National Assembly is actually accomplishing for them. Uh, particularly the Committee of Public Safety, that is uh, the, the segment of it that's designed to roust out enemies of the revolution. All of this is considered problematic and troubling to people who wanted some of the promise of the French Revolution but are not happy with the way that it's going. Okay, so... Um, among the areas where you see this resistance to the revolution, it becomes a counter-revolutionary movement known as the Vendée in Western France. This is where you have some royal supporters and some people who are just, they didn't want to go back to the monarchy exactly, but they were unhappy with the direction that the, the French revolutionary government was going. And so uh, what happens in France is that there's a deep schism, a split, and civil war breaks out and starts to get nastier and nastier. 
the sort of strongholds of support in France are away from the cities, especially away from the city of Paris itself. In Paris, you had people who were suffering most, working class people who were living in the city, really relying on uh, the kind of really sparsely available food supplies, uh, living on wages that were starvation wages, they were living in terrible conditions, the early beginnings of the industrial system as well, uh, were not really benefiting people who lived in Paris. There were also people in Paris. Paris is where um, most of the most radical talk was. This is where people had been uh, hashing out their complaints, their grievances, and their ideas for the future for the longest. People who were living in the countryside weren't as suffering as much in terms of food shortages. They weren't suffering as much um, from the living conditions. And so the changes of the radical revolution were just not, it didn't seem at all justified to people who were living at some remove from the uh, abuses that had inspired the revolution. Outside France, there is, in Britain especially, but also in Austria and Prussia, there is a horror uh, on the part of the ruling classes, of elites, in some cases middle class, but often nobility, who were just terrified by the French Revolution and the direction that had taken, the idea that so much of society could be overturned, so much of, of what, how they assumed things ought to run could be changed. This was just shocking and horrifying. And you can see with this cartoon on the right, uh, this is meant to be a depiction of the, the French Revolutionary Movement. You have a globe in flames. You have two people who are meant to uh, encapsulate like the worst of humanity, drunken, uh, toothless, um, the guy has a long, weird neck because he's been hanged, because he's a criminal. That's the idea. Um, and they're kind of dancing and drinking and stabbing uh, everything on the, the treasures that have been looted. As you can see, the, the you know gold and whatnot that are just under their feet being trampled. Meanwhile, the world is burning and this, they're just creating this chaos and destruction and nothing good. That was the depiction that comes out of the French Revolution. People like Edmund Burke are going to promote this idea and talk about it with horrors, why this can't possibly be allowed to spread to places like Britain. Uh, and really driving a lot of that fear is the, the real concern that it might spread to Britain, that there are just as many angry, oppressed people in Britain as there are in France, and it could happen at any time. Britain is going to avoid that by staying always just a little ahead. That's going to be their secret going forward. They always make just enough changes. They expand the right to vote just enough. They make just enough reforms to keep revolution from totally breaking out. But during the uh, 18th century, it is a close run thing. People are worried for a reason. Okay, so how does the reign of terror come to a close? Well, the change becomes observable by 1793. One of the leaders uh, of the radical phase of the revolution, Jean-Paul Marat, he was one of, he was a journalist, I guess you could say. He was a writer. He issued pamphlet after pamphlet arguing for why they needed to have the radical revolution. He also was one of the people who would denounce enemies of the revolution who would ultimately be arrested and brought to the guillotine and executed. In 1793, he had a skin condition, evidently, and took long baths. Some, um, one, during one of these baths, a woman by the name of Charlotte Corday walked into his house, climbed up the stairs, and stabbed him to death in the bath. She makes real no effort to escape. Uh, she's immediately apprehended. She's put in prison. She's sentenced to death, and she's dragged out and guillotined. And the leaders of the National Assembly, the Committee for Public Safety, really believe that this will be uh, a kind of a great moment to talk about the martyr to this movement, Jean-Paul Marat, and uh, work up a fury at this terrible woman who has tried to thwart the revolution. But they're caught off guard and surprised by the fact that the crowd doesn't really go for it. There's tremendous sympathy for Charlotte Corday. The reason she stabbed Jean-Paul Marat to death was because he denounced her brother, among others, and her brother was executed. And so she claims that she killed him because he was a monster and because he's getting people killed left and right and he doesn't care and he had to be stopped. And she doesn't apologize for it and she goes to her uh, death with her head held high. And the crowd, it's this moment that the leaders of the Committee for Public Safety realize that the mood is starting to shift. 
people are no longer embracing the radical revolution, even in Paris, as much as they once did, everyone is starting to become nervous that they could end up on a list as well. And they're afraid to speak out, but at the same time, the more afraid to speak out they become, the more inclined to speak out they are because they don't trust the Committee for Public Safety. They don't trust the revolutionary government. They have sympathy for opponents of the revolution at this point. And so the, the, the cracks are already forming. In 1794, in July, it comes to a head. This is known as the Thermidorian Reaction. Um, and there is an uprising, a coup inside the revolutionary government itself. Robespierre and the, the Committee for Public Safety had been dominating uh, French revolutionary government and politics up until this point. What happens is that a number of people from inside the revolutionary government are going to organize an armed uh, uprising to seize control of Robespierre and seize control of the chambers of the National Assembly. They do this. They arrest Robespierre. Uh, they put him on trial and he too will meet uh, the same fate he had sent so many others to. He's going to be guillotined. That will be the end of Robespierre. Uh, and in the meantime, they're going to take over the government for themselves. Uh, in 1795, uh, the, there's a new effort to create a constitution, and it creates something called the Directory. There's going to be a two-house legislature, uh, kind of like we have in the United States, and it's going to be led, instead of having a president, by a five-person committee, and that will be known as the Directors, the Directorate. Um, and this committee is going to be organized around a few people who had led this uprising to get rid of Robespierre. They claim they did it for the good of France and because he was out of control and because uh, he was corrupting the whole spirit of the revolution and all that kind of jazz. Uh, but there were a lot of unsavory rumors at the time. Some of the leaders of the directory, Paul Barat, very famously, and Jean Lambert Tallien, uh, they're famous or infamous, I guess I should say, because while they were uh, leaders in the French Revolutionary government, they were potentially on Robespierre's shortlist of enemies of the revolution. And that's because unlike Robespierre, the incorruptible who couldn't be bribed or swayed away from what he saw was the best thing to do, they were on the corruptible side. For instance, and that's what this cartoon depicts here, there was a rumor that seems to be corroborated by what evidence we can find that um, Paul Barat and Jean Lambert Tallien were dispatched as part of their job as uh, members of the revolutionary government to oversee the arrest of various nobles who were still in France late in the revolutionary movement. And so there was a list made up of people who had noble birth, noble heritage, and these people were identified as enemies of the state. They were supposed to be arrested and ultimately executed. That's what happened to people under Robespierre. On this list were a couple of pretty young women, and um, they were supposed to be, they were nobles, and they were supposed to be on the list to be executed. And as far as anyone knew, they were on the list. And then, through mysterious means, they were suddenly not on the list, but they were engaged in uh, extramarital affairs with Paul Barat and Jean Lambert Tallien. So it was pretty obvious to everyone what had happened there. They had uh, taken advantage of their position to take these women as mistresses in order to, uh, and the women had gone along with it in order to not die. Um, and the whole thing was very, very unsavory. And so this uh, political cartoon is meant to capture that. You can see the two women kind of dancing behind this veil. That's Paul Barat, uh, who was a portly fellow, as far as I can say, sitting there uh, drinking wine, and he's slovenly, etc. And he's drunk, and he's guilty of all these excesses while he watches these dancing ladies. And the guy who's over there in the right-hand corner peeking behind the curtain has an interesting role in this whole situation. He's the corporal that they've chosen to help support that movement to take over the government. When the coup to seize Robespierre was put into place, they needed somebody who was going to help with military support so that in case there was any resistance, they could crush that resistance quickly. And so they chose an artillery officer 
uh, to come into Paris and stop anyone who tried to put up a fight on behalf of Robespierre. And he later will say that it was nothing, just a whiff of grape shot sent away anybody who uh, thought to resist, and it was no big deal at all. But in order to reward him, um, it seems that this person was entered into their inner circle, their social circle, and he ends up married to one of those dancing girls depicted there, a woman by the name of Josephine Beauharnais. And this corporal, who was called in to provide this military backup to Paul Barat and Talian as they take over the directory, is, of course, famous. Dun, dun, dun. We'll talk about him next time. Um, famously known by his first name, Napoleon. Bum, bum, bum. So next week, we're going to talk about Napoleon and all his many doings. And it's going to be a thrill. And it's going to be great. So thanks for listening. Bye.